Good morning. In Chapter 4, we learned about functional modeling, where we looked at the basic business processes or the functionality of a system. In Chapter 5, we're going to learn about structural modeling. And structural modeling describes the structure or the, the foundation, the framework of a system <clears throat> using the objects that support that business process. Structural modeling is where we describe the objects that are, um, the information that are stored, used, and created in the system. In Chapter 4, we learned about functional modeling, where we identified the business processes or the functionality of a system. In Chapter 5, we're going to learn about structural modeling. Structural modeling describes the structure of the objects that support the business processes. If you think about the framework of a building, the structure or the format of a building, we are going to identify the objects that make up the structure of our system. The objects, the information, how the information is stored and used and created in the system. And these objects represent the ideas or the concepts within this problem domain. So the basic elements of a structural model are classes, attributes, operations, and relationships. This should be very familiar to you from your experience with object-oriented programming languages such as Java and C++. Classes are made up of objects and attributes, and classes are in relationship or have relationships with other classes. Attributes and operations within a class need to be relevant to the problem domain. So say for instance I have a student database in my Weber, excuse me, a student class in my Weber State um, system. <clears throat> I might have an attribute of a student that would be the color of hair, but that is not relevant within the problem, within the system. Attributes and operations within a class need to be relevant to the problem domain. So if I had a student class within a Weber State system, <clears throat> it, the color of a student's hair would be an effective attribute, but it is not within the problem domain. And again, an operation. A student may, able to, may be able to drive to school as an operation within a student class, but it is not relevant to the problem domain. There are several different ways that we can go about identifying these objects or these classes within our system. And one of the best ways is through a textual analysis. We have already identified and described, modeled, use case diagrams and use case descriptions and activity diagrams. So if I go back to this documentation that I have already created, and I'm looking for key words to describe attributes, which might be identified as nouns, and operations, which I can identify as verbs. If you look at figure 5.1, under the object identification section on page 199, you're going to see some parts of speech that I am looking for within my document, such as my use case description, that will help me to identify objects and operations and also relationships among the different objects that I identify. So let's refer to the make old patient appointment use case description. Just by using my parts of speech, I might be able to identify potential objects. I'm looking for proper or improper nouns. I'm looking for nouns such as old patient, appointment, doctors, patient. Um, I see name and address, patient information. I also see appointment times as I work my way through this document. If I were looking for potential operations, I could identify verb or verb types such as ask for a new appointment, ask to cancel or change existing appointment, contact the office, provide the receptionist with, make a new appointment, cancel an existing appointment, change an existing appointment, schedules a new appointment. So I'm looking for parts of speech on my textual documents that I have created to help me identify objects. And within that attributes and operations, and also I can identify relationships. If I go back to my textual analysis guidelines on figure 5.1, I can also be able to identify relationships within my document analysis. 
once I have identified objects within a system and I've identified potential attributes and operations, the next thing I need to look for are potential relationships between those objects. And there are three basic types of relationship categories, generalization, aggregation, and association relationships. The first one, generaliz generalization, is inheritance with superclasses and subclasses. You can think of the words, the keywords, a kind of. So inheritance would say an employee is a kind of a person because an employee can inherit from attributes and operations from a person. Another example, a secretary is a kind of an employee and an employee is a kind of a person. So I see superclasses and subclasses. <clears throat> the second type of relationship would be considered aggregation. And aggregation relationships relate parts to a whole or assembly. So let's say, for instance, I would use the keywords a part of, related to, contained in, associated with, a member of. These are some of the phrases that I would use to identify aggregation relationships. So an employee is a part of a department. I can already tell that an employee is not a kind of a department, but an employee is a part of a department. And a department is part of an organization. And so these would indicate aggregation relationships between employee and department or organization. The last of the type of relationships is an association. So it's like a part of, but it's not as clearly defined. So say, for instance, a patient makes an appointment, but is a patient a part of an appointment? Clearly, they are associated, and a patient and appointment are associated with one another, but it is not necessarily a part of. And so I can have a, an association relationship to indicate that they are indeed related, that a patient object and an appointment object are indeed related. So once we have identified objects, the next thing that we want to do is identify some tools that we can use for structural modeling. And the first tool that we're going to talk about today is CRC cards. CRC stands for Class Responsibility Collaboration Cards. And this is used to document the responsibility and the collaborations of a class. So I have an object, and I'd like to know who it is um, in relationship with, what its attributes and its operations are, and get it down clearly defined on some kind of a document. And I will use an index card or a piece of paper to document the details of a single class object. So the responsibility part of a CRC card is defined in two parts. The first part is knowing what you should know. So a single class, what should it know about itself? Such as a class object should probably know its name, its address, its appointment times, its items ordered, things that a class object should know about itself. The second part of the responsibility is doing. What can a class object do? Such as make an appointment, order things, call the office. These are activities or operations that an object should be able to do. The collaboration part of a CRC card is the collaboration between two or more objects. Who are they in relationship with? A patient makes an appointment, requires the help of a receptionist, for that matter, we have an appointment, a patient, and a receptionist object that are all in relationship with one another. So for instance, an appointment object. What should appointment know about itself? Well, it should know its date and time of the appointment, who, it's in, who is involved in the appointment, the doctor, the patient, the receptionist, who is scheduled the appointment, if you want to track that sort of thing. Some of the things that an appointment can do well, it can create itself, it can delete itself, it can update itself. <clears throat> These things are going to be documented on a CRC card. So if you look at figure 5-6 on page 206 of your textbook, under the section CRC card, we can see a template of a CRC card. It is made up of a front, let's think of it as an index card. On the front of the index card is some general information. And on the back of the index card, we have some additional information about it. On the front of a card, we have the name of the class that we are detailing. We have an ID field in order to uniquely identify it from any of the other classes. The type of class is identified under type. 
Classes can be either concrete or abstract. An abstract class might be something like a person. I will probably never instantiate an object of a person class. Instead, the person class is going to be inherited as a super class for, let's say, a patient and an employee. I would instantiate objects of the patient class and the employee class, so those are called concrete classes. So abstract classes are used as a template or a superclass for inherited classes, and concrete classes are ones that I would instantiate objects of. For the purposes of our class, we are always going to use domain classes. There are many different types of classes that we will be referring to domain classes here. The next section is the description, and this is just a brief description of the purpose of this particular class. And then we have responsibilities and collaborators. Responsibilities are the things that a class object should be able to do, such as make appointments, calculate last visits. These are, will turn out to be the operations. The collaborators, these are the other objects that this particular object interacts with. On the back side of our index card, we're going to see attributes and relationships. We're going to detail the attributes, and this are the things that an object should know about itself. For instance, an old patient should know an amount, perhaps that's the balance on their um, account, and it also should know who its insurance carrier are. The relationship section indicates the type of relationship that this particular class is has with each of those diff different classes. So under collaborators, I have a list of objects that there is in interacting with. And under relationships, this is where I identify the type of interaction that is occurring between objects. CRC cards are very useful. They allow us to capture and describe essential elements of a class. If I have taken a single use case and I've identified a number of objects that would be interacting with one another as a part of a single use case, and then I've created CRC cards for each one of those potential objects, I can use those CRC cards to role play a single path or a scenario through a use case using my use case description document. And through that role playing scenario, I can actually help identify additional potential objects, or I can even delete objects that I've already identified as being an unnecessary as a part of that scenario. So once I have developed a set of CRC cards with the details of the objects, the next thing I need to do is create a graphical representation of all of the objects that I have identified, and we'll do that through a class diagram. The details of the class diagram will be on the next lecture.